I cannot but share this response with all of you. Welcome, Vanakam. And a big thank you to everyone who watches these videos with great interest. Not only watch them, but also think through them and even think beyond them. And it is, and it is this that gives me a great sense of being rewarded. And I want to thank you most sincerely for your part in making this venture a relevant and meaningful one. Now you would know, uh, recall that yesterday I posted a video under the title, The Beauty of Life. You asked me to do it. And as I stated therein, I did that video in, request to, uh, in response to a request <clears throat> made by a participant in this program. And I was quite pleased, greatly encouraged, that someone wants to know something about the beauty of life and how life can be made even more beautiful. The sense of beauty. We cannot live by bread alone. Being human, we need bread plus beauty. But of course, beauty is widely misunderstood. It's culturally degraded, commercially exploited, and uh, vulgarly abused. Uh, given all that, given these aberrations, or apart from these aberrations, there is something called the beauty of life. Life is beautiful. Life is meant to be beautiful. Life must forever remain beautiful. That's our commitment. That's our excitement. So that was the reason why I immediately responded to the request and made that video. And I'm glad to say that not only really that and say not only that uh, so many of you have seen it, but that so many of you have responded so movingly and meaningfully. And in this video, I'm just going to take up randomly one response, read, it, read the whole response to you. <clears throat> and because I don't have the permission from the, resp uh, the respond responder, <clears throat> uh, I will not reveal uh, the identity. I'll only read the text to you, then maybe say a word or two by way of reflection, uh, sharing with you the thoughts that sort of awakened in my mind as I read this response. Let me read the text to you. Sir, your exposition of beauty is itself beauty. You seem to be many different people rolled into one. A poet, a literary person, a polymath, an orator, a humanist, an astute observer and a student of nature, a sociologist, a cultural anthropologist, and so on, and much more. It's not just your erudition and articulation that are wonderful. It's also your grasp and connection with the sublime things of life. Things that make it such a priceless gift. Things like beauty, nobility, graciousness, the intrinsic worth of every human being. Hearing you speak helps us get in touch with these qualities in ourselves. And this is the most touching thing for me. <clears throat> and this is the heart of the matter. That's why the excitement of reading this response could not be contained. And I had to share it with all of you. This is absolutely the heart, heart of the matter. Hearing you speak helps us get in touch with these qualities in ourselves. Because these, like the great ones say, lie at the core of every one of us. Absolutely true. There is nothing that I have said. There is nothing that I am saying. There is nothing that I will ever say which is not already in the core, to borrow the words from this response, which is not already in the core of your being, each one of you. The challenge is, the task is, the sacred beauty is to access it, to become aware of it, and to make that beautiful part of your being the most active 
an expressive part of your being, which is when <clears throat> your life becomes beautiful. No one has to import the beauty of life into you that's already present, but present in a dormant manner, so much so that for all practical purposes it doesn't exist, but it is there just to be tapped, tapped into or woken up, activated, made use of, and then life becomes beautiful. So this was precisely, this was precisely what I wanted to communicate, but I, since I don't have the quality of communication that this beloved uh, person has, I did not state it as clearly as has been stated in this part of the text. <clears throat> I'll come back to this idea, hopefully, after a while. Um, so uh, this, I believe, sir, is your greatest service to the society. That's very true. What I'm doing is couched in the form, as far as I'm aware of, in the form of a service to society, to help people get in touch with their intrinsic beauty, nobility, and light. Beautiful. Thank you, sir. May you stay blessed. Now, this is the response. <clears throat> now, let me take up the very first point that she made. She thinks, and I think she is exaggerating my worth. Uh, perhaps she means every word of what is said here, but uh, to me it sounds exaggerated bec uh, because I'm not aware of this to the extent that the response makes me aware of. Therefore, I feel it is exaggerated. But the possibility and the truth could well be that the person who has responded in this manner is way ahead of me in this respect. And therefore, the small seeds of thought and the small, um, shall I say, nuggets of intellectual, imaginative experience that I provided through that video becomes magnified in his or her personality and therefore it is experienced in this manner and the person who states it may be stating it in a state of sincerity that is with avoiding exaggeration or distortion either way sticking to the exact shade of the meaning and the experience. <clears throat> now <clears throat> what I want to say based on this is that we are living in an age of specialization and worse, super specialization. Now, I can understand why there is uh, specialization and super specialization. The <coughs> uh, um, knowledge is exploding and no one can really cope with the pace at, at which knowledge is increasing in our times. Um, now, to give you just an, a, a very rough and quick idea of what I mean, the American, the Library of American Congress has more than 20 million books. And that's not a complete collection of all the books possible. It's just one collection. Do you think it's possible for anyone to read all those 20 million books. I don't know how many books I have read in my lifetime. It's not possible to read even 10,000 books in a human being's lifetime. Unless you're an, ex an expert in quick reading, and I don't believe in quick reading, I believe in very slow reading, and I make notes on every book that I read even today, note down the important ideas and the page or pages where these ideas occur so that if I have to refer to this in the course of my writing or speaking, I know exactly where to look for them. <clears throat> so I make very, very slow progress with books. So when I think of the little that I know and compare it with the vast ocean of knowledge that remains to be mastered, I feel deeply and sometimes painfully humbled. Therefore, I can understand that it's a sensible strategy to focus on a small area and to go deeper and deeper into it. That's why specialization and super specialization as, as are described as 
knowing more and more about less and less. Knowing more and more about less and less. But while this has a positive side, this also has a flip side, which I want to very briefly mention. Let me take the example of a legendary doctor who worked in Tamil Nadu and parts of Kerala. His name was Dr. Somerville. He was a British national. He began his life as an engineer, but switched over to medicine and specialized uh, in surgery. Now, he was uh, amazing in his skill and in his speed in conducting surgery. But besides being a legendary surgeon, Dr. Somerville was also a distinguished painter and an amazing musician. I once read an article in a Malayalam newspaper which, is, which was about the therapeutic value of music. And the main instance cited in that article was that of Somerville. And the author says that Somerville, in those days when anesthesia was at its crudest stage of development, and therefore pain management was not very good, Somerville would go and sit near the bed of his patients, would be in extreme pain, and he would pay the, play the violin to them and soothe them. I challenge you to find out if there is a doctor like that today. Multifaceted personality. I had the good fortune to work for about four or five years very closely with Dr. Jacob T. John, who was the professor and head of the Department of Virology, Christian Medical College Fellow. That was when I was working in the field of HIV AIDS. By the way, my first book published was on HIV AIDS. <clears throat> So I was deep, uh, closely associated with the work of the AIDS awareness team constituted by Christian Medical College Velour. And what I found in Dr. John and what really appealed to me most is not only his amazing domain knowledge as a virologist, very distinguished viro virologist. Um, WHO used to uh, bang on his expertise in this, in this field. He, much after, long after he retired from service. Um, but also, he had the mind of a philosopher. He had the mind of a philosopher. So when my book was to be published, and I considered as to who should write the preface to my book, I decided that it would be written by none other than Dr. John. Because to me, <clears throat> a doctor being also a philosoph philosopher, it's a very precious thing. Why I'm citing this example is to emphasize the fact that if we care enough, we can develop our personality, our being, in a multi, uh, multi, 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 multifarious and multifornic, multifarious and multifornic fashion, rather than have a monochrome to our personality, one single color. Life must be at least a rainbow. You, you must at least develop yourself in seven different ways, in, sef, in seven different fields, seven different directions, and ultimately be an, able to synthesize knowledge from diverse sources so that your mind becomes rich enough to produce something, continue to produce something which is of value to others. Now in this context, like, let me make a reference to <clears throat> one of the <clears throat> uh, great poets of English literature in the modern times, T.S. Eliot. <clears throat> uh, in one of, his, one of his essays, T.S. Eliot says that we should keep our minds so enriched that our minds serve as the crucibles into which ideas of all kinds are free to enter and having entered therein can undergo a process similar to chemical reactions which then produce newer entities. <clears throat> so that is possible only if we develop ourselves, particularly our mental equipment, 
and I cannot separate the mental from the emotional because together they constitute the substance of the imaginative. To me, the most beautiful thing about the human being is the imaginative dimension. That's a, that's a dimension that transforms the dull and the drab into the beautiful. Develop your imaginative faculties. Otherwise, you become so uh, hand to mouth, uh, run of the mill, uh, mechanical, drab, boring, and bored, which is a self punishment. Actually, it's high time we realize that we often fail to do justice to ourselves. Most people fail to do justice to themselves. By not developing the various faculties that exist within them in an embryonic fashion, which if they had developed, they would have been overflowing with life. They would have been radiating happiness and joy and positivity. And they would have been a source of blessing to others. Instead, they have attained the opposite state. They feel embarrassed about themselves. They feel awkward. They also bear grudges against life itself and all around them. And they think that somebody has treated them harshly and life gave them a raw deal, etc. Whereas the simple fact is that they were unjust to themselves. So let's today resolve that we will do justice to ourselves. And it does not have to become a burden. It's not that you have to go and you know, chew up the libraries. No. Take it at your pace. But find time every day to pay attention to the noble and beautiful things of life. That's all. You don't have to burn the midnight oil. You don't, you don't have to be like a candle that burns at both ends. Just renounce the low, the mean, the negative, the vulgar, the, the uncultured, the brutal, with which our society abounds. Avoid mainstream media. Do not expose yourself to prime time discussions. I beg of you. Do not entertain low taste. You deserve much better. And after all, when you expose yourself to what is low and mean, your soul feels stifled. You cry over yourself that you did the disservice to yourself. Let's take better care of ourselves. Let us celebrate the goodness in each one of us. We are great. And that's, that's my message. We are great. You are great. I am great. I am great. I used to say like this, and when my children were growing up, they were a bit uh, taken aback. So my elder daughter asked me, Dad, are you sure that you're uh, not becoming proud and arrogant? Shouldn't you cultivate <clears throat> a little bit more of humility? And she, she said this to me when she, when she was a school kid. Because my, my children were always friends to me and uh, they were totally free to say and do what they want. And in fact, they were my best critics. <clears throat> but I told her that acknowledging what is actually there and coming into a state of responsibility for developing it better, making it nobler and better day by day, is a far more sensible, it is a healthier strategy or outlook on life than this <coughs> false, cheap, insincere, negative humility, which denies whatever is of worth and value within us and degrade us to the level of uh, asses and donkeys and say, oh, there is nothing good in me. No, everything, everything good is in me. There's no question about it. Now, it's up to me to acknowledge it, to develop it. <clears throat> I should recognize it, not to go around flaunting and boasting about it, but to come under the sober responsibility to develop whatever talents and good possibilities there are in me. So, not because I want to be a jewel in the crown for someone, not because I want to draw attention to myself, not because I want to gain in any material fashion on account of it, but because that's a social service I can render. 
maintaining myself beautifully, enriching myself so that I would have something of worth to give to a person who comes into contact with me, to impart something of light. That's the social service I wonder. And in fact, I'm amazed that this person has sensed it so accurately. Had I said it myself that this is exactly my goal, you would have perhaps felt a little uncomfortable about, about it, thinking that I'm blowing my own trumpet. Okay, now let's proceed. So I've commented on su super specialization, mainly to underline the fact that since we live in this age of super specialization, we must make it a special effort to de develop ourselves also in uh, several dimensions and directions so that in addition to super specialization, which is a desirable thing, we also have richness of being. After all, all the trophies that we gain via the uh, uh, path of super specialization will become very meaningless if end of the day we are, a su uh, uh, we are super specialists but very poor human beings. That's the point I make. Now, <clears throat> um, then she comments on my keenness to impart a touch of the beautiful, the noble, the gracious, etc. And in order to affirm the intrinsic worth of every being. My dear friends, this is something extremely, extremely important. Every one of us has tremendous intrinsic worth. Now, in order to understand this observation correctly, let me make a contrast between two types of worth. One is the intrinsic worth and the other is the instrumental worth. What a materialistic society and a pragmatic culture emphasized is the instrumental worth of every human being. That is to say, what is the use I can put this person to? How can I benefit from him or her? How can I employ this person in ways that are gainful to me. And what this attitude shuts out is the eye to see what is good in the other person. I'm only interested in dealing with people to the extent that they are profitable to me, they are useful to me. That is why we talk about the modern culture as the use and throw culture. Please, please understand that if you allow yourself to be used by anyone, you must also be willing to be discarded by everyone who uses you. Because that's the inevitable law of nature and life, that whatever is used will be discarded after it ceases to be useful. So, in instrumental verse. Now, in this context, let me make a brief reference to the giant of uh, German uh, philosophy, Immanuel Kant who said that the greatest crime against humanity, these are words worth remembering, the greatest crime against humanity is to use a human being as an instrument, as an instrument. He said, every human being must be deemed the ultimate purpose of life, the end of life, the very purpose of the whole existence, the whole of existence is comprehended in every human being. Therefore, when we deal with people, we must deal with them with respect, with reverence, with awe and wonder. It is this sense of awe and wonder about relating to each other that we have lost. And that's the main reason for the cultural poverty, emotional cheapness, and intellectual bankruptcy of our times. We have to regain the sense of reverence for life, life as, as it is manifested in you and me, in everyone, everything in nature. All of that is imprinted with the authority and the image of God. That's my ardent belief. So when I deal with you, my heart must be full of respect for you. I must deem it a privilege to be able to relate to you, even if it's only in this limited manner and mode. So, the idea of recognizing your intrinsic nobility. Now, in this age of materialism and pragmatism, 
there will be very few people who have the greatness or even the humanity to recognize your intrinsic worth. Therefore, it becomes all the more your responsibility to recognize your intrinsic worth, not only recognize, but also to enhance it, improve it, diversify it to the maximum extent, which should be your creative protest against the limitations and the aberrations of this materialistic pragmatist culture, <clears throat> which degraded, degrades human beings into mere tools and instruments. And I tell you, this problem has serious implications for interpersonal relationships. The reason why interpersonal relationships keep very poorly and is particularly crucial for ma married life and you know, divorce rates are going through the roof. It's a big area in itself. If I begin to examine that, time will get out of, out of hand. <clears throat> so the idea of recognizing intrinsic worth. <clears throat> she consolidates that, that idea in the next paragraph. Let me read that out to you. Hearing you speak helps us get in touch with these qualities in ourselves. This is actually the only legitimacy that a speaker can claim. The function of a, a, a speaker, a, the function of somebody who shares a video with you, as in the present context to be more precise, is not to impress you, is not to display his knowledge, or not to cultivate some kind of equation. He should have only one goal and one aim only and that is beautifully phrased here that is to help us in touch with these qualities in ourselves because these like the great ones have said lie at the core of every one of us <clears throat> now <clears throat> since i've been in the field of education i've done a certain amount of uh, reading and research in the philosophy of education because I have to understand what education means in order to be able to teach. The pathetic thing in this country is that even 99% of the teachers in higher education, leave alone school education, 99% of the teachers in higher education do not bother to understand what education is. They practice education without knowing what it is. A responsible teacher will try and find out or try and arrive at an adequate understanding of education so that his practice of education can, can be made to conform to the best <clears throat> norms and ideals of education. So I've done a, a considerable amount of uh, reading and research in education from Plato onwards uh, down to our own times. <clears throat> <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me including Gandhi's idea of education, Aurobindo's idea of education, Tagore's idea of education, that, that whole, whole spectrum. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> every theory on education, every philosophical text on education I have read, emphasizes the fact that the teacher's role is not to import strange and outlandish things into the mind of the students. The teacher's role is only to awaken that which already exists in the mind of the child. The amazing thing about the human being is that there, uh, that there is, of course, there is a universe outside of him or her, but even more importantly, there is a universe within each one of us. Each one of us is a universe. That's the truth. It's not only that we have a universe all around us, we can see that, but there's an unseen, invisible universe. Each one of us is that universe. Our possibilities are unlimited, exciting, incredible, divine, divine. That's why in India, we do this namaste. I recognize the God in you. That divine dimension is the dimension of the infiniteness in us. We are also, we are finite and at the same time we are infinite. The possibilities, possibilities are really infinite. Now, 
what a teacher has to do is actually to wake up, to awaken these dormant areas in the universe of knowledge. It is like shedding light, shedding light. Uh, imagine uh, a landscape where there is no light. You are trying to explore the landscape. You use a torch. So wherever you flash the torch light, you can see what's there. Everything exists there, but for you, while you're holding the torch light and looking at the area, the spot where the torch is flashed, you see only that spot. It doesn't mean that the rest of the landscape does not exist. So the fact that we are aware at certain stages in our life of only this much and this much and this much, does not mean that the other things don't exist. The tragedy of human life is that even the most outstanding, the greatest geniuses among uh, humanity, Nobel laureates, etc., even they may not be using even 25% of their possibilities because our possibilities are so vast and unending. So what we have to do is to believe in the, the incredible universe of which we are the owners, if you like, or we are the manifestations, and try to become aware more and more incrementally of the many, many areas, the many mind fields of you know, gold, whatever, you know, the great, uh, the most precious things. Hmm? We are a gold mine. We are much more than a gold mine. We are a whole continent of gold mines. But we are sleeping over it. And many people, most people die before they become even aware of it. And I think that is the pathos of life. And one of the reasons why I've decided to launch into this enterprise, against which many people counsel me, saying that social media is not the medium for you to communicate such ideas. Nobody will be interested in this. You'll have to beat a hasty retreat. But I felt impelled from within because I have great faith, unfailing, unfading faith in the good potentialities in my fellow human beings. I still believe that there is something to which I can appeal. I believe I can still try and, and impart a little glow to the light that's already within you. Jesus said, every, every human being is like a candle lit but kept under a bushel. Therefore, it doesn't give light. It's light within you. All we have to do is to remove the bushel the hard outer covering so that light can express itself. And that's precisely the goal of our fellowship through this medium of YouTube. And I'm so very glad that more and more individuals are recognizing it. This is not the only response of this kind. There are many. There are many. You know, it's already 33. With dealing with just one response has taken 33 minutes already. Therefore, you can imagine, I cannot be... Uh, you know, reading out all the messages and comment on them. When I comment on one particular response, it is meant to be also as a recognition of the good, positive contributions, very sensitive, imaginative responses made by so many people to this video and several other videos, so that they should know that their goodness of life, the beauty of their mind, the purity of their heart, the greatness of your soul is being felt, recognized by me, and it is actually serving as, as a fund of energy, intellectual, imaginative energy for me. And with, without any exaggeration, I'm telling you, I'm able to continue this mission, I'm able to do this much work, only because when I sit down to record my thoughts, and I record my thoughts most spontaneously. I don't ha even have a piece of paper in my hand, as you can see. What facilitates this work is the fact that I connect. Somehow I connect mentally, em em emotionally, imaginatively, spiritually to all of you. That's why I read your responses with keen interest. Each time I read your response, I'm actually taking it deep into myself because that enables me to connect to each one of you so much better. And that then becomes a source of energy for me to go on like this. So I want you to know that each one of you is an active participant and you're making significant contributions towards the enhancement of the contents of this 
YouTube Sangamam. So I close by expressing my deep uh, sense of gratitude to this person who has responded in this most beautiful manner. It simply shows how beautiful that person is because he or she is ahead of me in the beauty of what I have stated because the beauty of what I have stated has been taken several notches higher by this response. Otherwise, I would not have been able to make another video on the basis of this response uh, uh, in this manner. So, thank you once again. You can only say, may the Almighty bless you and all like you. And may this light spread from person to person. And may this light cover the face of Mother India. May this light cover the face of Mother India. After all, our prayer has been Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jodurgamaya Mrityorma Amradam Gamaya From darkness, lead us to light, to light, to light. And the great German philosopher, poet, Novelist, dramatist, Goethe, Goethe, G O E T H E pronounced Goethe. Or in pure German, I think it's pronounced as Goethe, Goethe. Difficult to pronounce, Goethe. He lay dying in his bed. And people were keen to know what his last words would be. The last words of, a, of the greatest genius Germany had seen whom Napoleon admired on his bended knees. Uh, Goethe's novel, Soros of Young Werther, was acclaimed by Napoleon Bonaparte as the greatest novel ever written. I don't agree with that assessment from my literary point of view. I don't agree, but this is what Napoleon Bonaparte said. So Goethe was dying and people are very keen to know what the last pronouncement would be, the last words uttered by this genius of all geniuses. You know what he said? The last words. A little more light. He died. A little more light. That's exactly the essence of my life. I say to you, a little more light. A little more light. <laughs>